Hello everyone. Welcome to the virtual Special Collections and Archives at Cal Poly. My name is Laura Sorvetti, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Reference and Instruction Specialist at Special Collections and Archives. And I wanted to say hello and introduce you to our archives to prepare you for your University Archives Research Project this quarter and to give you a little bit of information about archives and how they work for your future research um, at Cal Poly and beyond. Cal Poly Special Collections and Archives is located on the fourth floor of the Kennedy Library. You can always come visit us to get help with your research projects, to look at archival material in the reading room, to explore our current exhibits, and to get help with your research projects. I also went through the history program at Cal Poly. I uh, did my undergrad in history and liberal studies, and then I came back for a graduate degree in history as well. After I graduated, I began working full-time at the archives, and I've been there for about 10 years now. And it's always the most exciting thing to meet all of you um, in the History 100 class and see all of the amazing research you do on Cal Poly. The podcast and the readings for this week do a great job at introducing you to archives. So I won't try to do too much of the same information, but just emphasize some of the key points and how they relate to the university archives. There are lots of different types of archives, and each, each individual archive has a collecting area that they focus on, and this is to help keep our collections focused so we're not trying to collect everything. It also helps us to not compete with each other for the same collecting topics. And it also helps you as researchers to be able to go to one place to see a lot of material about a topic that you might be interested in. At Cal Poly, we have a few areas of focus. The largest of our collections is the University Archives. We also have records documenting the experiences of people, families, organizations on the Central Coast. We have records documenting the built environment of California. One of our most famous collections that's used internationally is the Julia Morgan Papers. Julia Morgan was the architect who designed Hearst Castle and was a prolific architect, did about 700 other projects in the U.S., especially in California. And was one of the first was the first woman licensed to be an architect in California and so we get a lot of people studying different topics related to Julia Morgan who come to use our materials. We also have comics, rare books, artist books, and a lot of variety of collections related to experiences of people in California. Materials come to us through donation, by families, by organizations, or they can be transferred from university units. The University Archives is actually a big, big umbrella under which a lot of different archival collections exist. These are all collections that document the experiences of people who were involved with Cal Poly. That could be students, faculty, staff, administrators, alumni, local community. And there's a lot of different formats of material in the archives. The University Archives dates from 1901, when we were first established as a, as a school, um, and it extends to the present. We are actively collecting records of the current times in, and adding them to the University Archives. Here's a few examples on this slide of formats of material. We have historic photos. We have videos, films, VHS tapes, audio tapes. We also archive the Cal Poly websites. Since 2015, we've been capturing the websites as they change over time, and that's a great research tool. We have a few objects in our collections. One notable one is this um, ceremonial spade that was used by graduating students to um, dig a hole to plant their class tree each year. And so each of these ribbons is um, for a, a, a class. We also have scrapbooks. 
we have yearbooks from the about 1906 to about the 19 around 1980. We have posters, maps, architectural plans, and we also have the student newspaper, which dates back to 1916. As the podcast and the readings discussed this week, archives are a little bit different than libraries in a few different ways. One is that we deal with primary sources that are all of those different formats that we just looked at. They don't always fit neatly on a shelf. They are not discrete, easily described items. So archives will bring a collection in as it's donated or transferred and we will organize it and keep it in its collection as it was given to the archives. Here is an example. We have the collection of President Robert E. Kennedy, that's Cal Poly President Robert E. Kennedy, who was president here from about 1967 to 1979. And when he retired, his office transferred all of his records to the university archives. It's about 40 boxes of material that covers that time period. And we will always keep that collection as a unit. And instead of taking out material and trying to organize it by subject, like you might find in the library. So that's a good thing to know when you're doing research, because you'll want to think about whose collection will I want to look at to find materials about the topic or the subject I'm researching. If you come into the archives to tell me that you're researching the impact of the Vietnam War at Cal Poly, I will sit with you and say, all right, let's look at all the collections we have, which collections cover that time period, have material that might document those experiences at Cal Poly. This is a photo of the box as if we would hand it to you in the archives. This is a pretty big box. Um, and I wanted to show you it because on the side here is a label I don't know if you can see it in this video. It says student unrest, 1960s and 1970s. And I show this to you because this is Kennedy's original label for his box. And it's a word that I wouldn't normally use. Unrest is not a keyword I would usually search. I might search protest instead. And so knowing how they, um, describe their materials is important because the archives keeps that description because we think it's important for you to know how that person was referring to the materials in their collections. This is the inside of that box. At a later date we might rehouse it because these are the original file folders which are not acid free and will eventually kind of get yellowed out but for now they're doing okay. This is a pretty standard view of a box in a collection. We keep items in the folders that they came to us. If they didn't come in folders, we'll put them in folders so that we can organize them into more discrete um, sections. And this is really helpful for you as researchers to be able to identify the boxes in the folders you want to look at. Archives don't typically describe each individual item. For example, this box has 2,500 pieces of paper in it, and that would take a long time. So an easier way for archives is to describe things to a box level, like student unrest 1960s and 70s, or in a um, thoroughly processed collection, we will describe things to a folder level. So we'll give you a list of all of the folders in each box, which is what we have for the Kennedy papers. And you can see here we have his original file names, and that will be really useful to help us understand how he's thinking about these topics. For example, here is one of the folders in that box. This folder is titled 380 Demonstrations Campus-Wide 1967-68. So again, he's using the word demonstration. I probably wouldn't have started with that keyword, but now I know to add it to my searching. And I can see that he's sort of gathering files about activities that were happening at Cal Poly at that year. I have photographed everything in this file for you to look at. Maybe we'll look at it on Thursday. There's about 160 pieces of paper just in this folder. And here is the first and second page in here. This is a stapled packet of material. The first page says County of San Luis Obispo Office Memorandum, dated from 1968, June, and addressed to Sheriff Mansfield. And so this item actually wasn't even created by um, 
Robert Kennedy, but he has added some information down here, written to another person. Hey, Clyde Fisher, for your information only, no action or response needed, please return attached materials. And so it appears Fisher returned those materials to Kennedy because now they're back in Kennedy's papers. One of the things to know about collections is within one person's collection, you will find material that might be created by many different people and that that person received and kept in their files. So in this case, we have a um, duplicate of a poster that looks like it was put out. It says the resistance caravan comes to your town. And this was coming to Guadalupe, it looks like, in June. And so this is saying that this item here made its way to Robert E. Kennedy, and he kept it and he filed it in his collection. And now we have that as a resource. We don't have any other resistance caravan collections in our materials, in our, in our archives, but luckily we have it documented through Kennedy's papers. So you'll be discovering materials created by a wide variety of people. I said that we create these lists of box or folders for you to um, use to do your research. These are called finding aids and they're descriptive guides and inventories to collections that we've written to help you know what's in that box, in those boxes. Sometimes it can be as simple as we have a collection, there's one box, come in and look at it. Other times what we call a processed collection will have information that's much more detailed. It will have um, information that gives you a sense of the entire collection, what the archivist thinks are important parts to know about the collection, and then it has something that's called um, an inventory or box list. And I have taken a screenshot of one of the parts of the box list here so you can see the items described in box one, folders one through six. And so this helps you this collection hasn't been digitized in its entirety, but you can look through this list and say, you know, I'm interested in photographs of the Cultural Advisory Committee in 1985. Archives, can you help me to get photos of the materials in there while you're closed? And we'll go in and take photos for you. I also have here a screenshot of a photo in the archives. We have digitized selections from this, and so you can browse those on our website. I wanted to end with a couple uh, details about challenges of doing archival research. One thing to know is that there are always going to be silences and gaps in archives. Archives can't collect everything that's ever been created, and we're always trying to select things that we think are of enduring historic value. And that's a great idea, but the execution of it is is based on what people think is historically valuable. And so that idea changes over time. It might be that in, it, in, the, in, in the past, this might have been things that were created by wealthy, famous people in power. Nowadays, we want to collect more that represents the experiences of all people in our geographic area. In our archives, you will find that there are gaps and silences in the university archives. An example in our archives is that we do not have records of the Black Student Union in the 60s and 70s at Cal Poly. So instead, we need to look at other ways we can approach research about topics where we can't find anything created by the people or groups we're studying. In this case, we were able to find articles about the BSU in the student newspaper. But we also have to acknowledge that those are being created by people with different perspectives and aren't created by the people that we're studying. And so that's something you'll address in your research. And sometimes it becomes a point where I just have to say in my research, you know, this doesn't exist in the archives and that in itself is significant. There are other examples of material that is not missing from the archives but can't be made available for a certain amount of time. For us at Cal Poly, a lot of that information is related to health privacy and student privacy. These are two uh, laws that we follow, HIPAA and FERPA. HIPAA protects your health privacy, so we're not going to share information about people's health records. And you're seeing that a lot with the coronavirus 
news where we try to not share information about individuals, but sort of aggregate it and take out that personally identifying information. The same with educational privacy. We can share information that's out in the newspaper or in yearbooks or in published documents, but we don't share information about students' private student records, and that includes things like grades, classes that they took, year they were born, sort of that behind-the-scenes information that's private to that student. And sometimes we'll have other restrictions. Uh, sometimes a, res a donor will say, you know, I don't want you to make this available until I pass away, or um, we can't release this information for 10 more years. And we don't have too much of that at all in the university archives, but in your future research, you might need to be aware of that. So these are some of the challenges with doing archival research. I think I'll end there, and I have a separate video to introduce you to how to do the actual online research this quarter, so check that out, and I'll see you next time.